Good evening, everyone. My name is Rosa Murray, and I'm a member of the core group of the Scottish Theatre Network. Tonight is my privilege to welcome you to our conversation on a faith-based challenge to COP26 with Father Sean McDonough. But before we move into our conversation, I'd like to invite Mike Miniter, a member of the Caritas Justice and Peace Commission of the Archdiocese of St Andrews in Edinburgh. Creating God for this wonderful universe and this beautiful earth of which we are a part, we praise you. For the gift of being alive, we praise you. For the 14 billion years of grace from the beginning to this moment, we praise you. Suffering God, you revealed yourself in the flow and beauty and pain of life on earth. Humankind has so failed to care for the earth that we now threaten our own future. for our arrogance in dominating and exploiting the earth. Lord have mercy. For our avarice in depleting resources, damaging lives and despoiling the earth. Christ have mercy. for our apathy in observing the harm without taking urgent action. Lord have mercy. Redeeming, inspiring God, open our eyes, ears and minds to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Open our hearts to have empathy with all the earth. Inspire us so, so we help to regreen the church and to sustain our common home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thanks, Mike. I'd now like to hand over to Eileen Clarkson, who is the Senior Campaigns Officer with SCIAF, who are one of the groups who have co-badged our conversation this evening. Welcome, Eileen. You should see the option there to unmute Eileen. Thank you, thanks very much. At SCAFT, we often get asked, uh, why do you work on climate change? Aren't you there to help people on issues like hunger? Well, I suppose the simple answer to that, unpredicted, to that is that unpredictable weather patterns caused by climate change is one of the causes of hunger. And I just want to give you a little flavour of what we've been working on with partners. We've been working on a project in Malawi on with Scottish government funded, the Scottish government fungus funded that focuses on climate change. And its aims is to promote and improve communities access to water, food and energy. But central to that work was the local communities, what they identified as the problems, what they wanted to see happen and their local knowledge. And for SCIAF that approach is what underpins our work giving communities the support they need to build their way out of poverty in a sustainable way. And with the up and coming COP26, we're working with many organizations to try and ensure world leaders listen to the voices of faith-based civil society and in the name of the people most affected by climate change, 
who are often the voiceless. So SCAF's running a petition, which if you haven't done so, I urge you to sign. And we're also encouraging people to take part in a march in Glasgow as part of a global day of action on November the 6th. And so to our speaker, well, Father Sean, as we all know, has been a long time activist on issues relating to climate change. And he's spoken often of his introduction and development of these issues through his studies with Thomas Berry. He's also written on the subject of climate change for 35 years, and of course was a consultant on Laudato Si. So I'm delighted that he's come to agree to come to speak to us and share his wealth of knowledge and experience. And it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Father Sean McDonough. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, consultation here tonight. Uh, a few weeks ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was set up in 1988 to bring scientists together to look at what was happening to our planet. So for almost 30 years, a scientific community has been meeting and bringing out reports every five or six years. So the most recent one, the sixth one, made it very clear it's univocal that actually human activity is behind the climate change that we notice at the present. So <clears throat> this is something quite new to many people, although, as I say, it's 30 years since the scientific community taught us about this. And I'll talk about that tonight in terms of politicians, because very often in the past they were saying one thing, like your own prime minister in 2015, as he was writing for the Telegraph, he was saying that the the basis for climate change has no basis in, in fact, or sorry, in, in science, which was totally wrong. And now he's telling people that to look at the science so that they, they begin to take it quite seriously. Uh, when we look at uh, our planet, the before the Industrial Revolution began in Britain in, in the 1750s, uh, our, our atmosphere is composed of nitrogen and oxygen, neither of which retain uh, heat. However, carbon dioxide does. And at that stage, before the Industrial Revolution, uh, carbon dioxide was 280 parts per million. Now, at this time, seven, uh, two centuries later, it is 416 parts per million. And the problem which was identified at the, at the uh, uh, the COP, the Conference of the Parties, which almost meets every year. It began in 1992 in Rio, uh, and uh, the one we have now in uh, uh, next month or in, in November is the 26th uh, Conference of the Parties. So uh, since then, uh, in, in, in Paris, they said we cannot allow uh, climate change uh, the to go ab above two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. If we do, we will get very, very problematic realities here on our planet. And one thing that uh, 2020 and 21 was well noted for is the extraordinary changes that have taken place on our planet. When we look at fires, the greatest fires ever on the continent of Australia took place in 2020. There is no idea how many creatures were destroyed in that. Certainly, vast, vast, in, in their billions were destroyed. That wasn't all. Uh, across Siberia, there were fires that would never, ever be associated with that part of the world in the past. And now they're here again to this time. And of course, in the United States of America, uh, the fires on the West Coast have been burning for almost uh, six months. So on that level alone, it is clear that things have changed dramatically. We have also seen, of course, that, uh, for example, a, a few months ago, uh, we had the extraordinary rain in, in, in uh, the Netherlands and in, in Germany that did extraordinary damage. And also the, 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 the recent, recent uh, typhoon or hurricane that went through uh, New York and New York City. So it's clear to people today that our temperature and our climate is changing pretty dramatically. 
Now, we're only 1.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level at the moment. But uh, many uh, commentators would see that we will certainly go to 1.5 within five or six years. And if we keep uh, at our present level, we will probably go to three or four degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level in this century. Now, that would be catastrophic uh, for our planet. So uh, what were the things people were saying? Well, uh, tw the year 2020 has been the hottest year ever. In the last 10 years, since 2015, seven of the hottest years that has taken place in the last thousand years have took place in the last 10 years. So it's pretty clear uh, what is happening. Uh, for example, as I said, I, I went through the changes, for example, in uh, heat levels, uh, the, the climate change. I could also speak very much of the Gulf Stream. Uh, the, 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 um, the Gulf Stream brings water far from the Caribbean up by the west coast of Europe, and for example, of, of Ireland, and therefore our, our weather and, uh, and our climate is much milder than it would be if we didn't have the Gulf Stream. We're now taught, taught that, 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 that the Gulf Stream is at its lowest point in the last 1600 years. And many people are saying, or scientists, that it could close down within this century alone. That would have catastrophic implications for actually the people of Northern Europe. And those are the kind of things that we need to take extraordinary seriously at this point. Another area of the oceans, because we're talking about we're talking about the Antarctic and we're talking about Greenland. If we keep uh, heating up our world, if we go to three or four degrees Celsius, we could be talking about two to three meter rise in sea level in the next 100 or 150 years. And now because the vast majority of people on the planet, the 7.7 .7 billion people live actually on the coastline. That would be an enormous problem for people uh, 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 across the globe. So we have to take it very, very seriously uh, because this is what climate change is beginning to tell us. So we're talking about, for example, we're talking about the uh, Britain leading the world in the first two weeks of November on trying to get very systematic changes that brings down our carbon footprint very substantially. Now, the problem with that is not just Boris Johnson, but for example, my own, uh, the, the Prime Minister, the Taoiseach of Ireland today, because we are the president of the Security Council at the moment, gave a long talk today on the importance of climate change. The only problem is we don't take it seriously. In my lifetime, we have tripled the amount of cattle on our farms. Uh, so in, at, at this stage in Ireland, 34% of our greenhouse gases come actually from agriculture and mainly are methane. And methane is 50 times more heat retentive than carbon dioxide. And there's very little effort to begin to, to change that. For example, I'm uh, president of a, uh, in, a non-government organization here in Ireland called Antashka, our environment. And the government of Holland, Netherlands, in the last about five years, has, uh, has taken off 100,000 cattle out of their herd. But they are interested in having uh, a cheese factory in Ireland. So uh, a, 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 an Irish dairy company is in, in, in dialogue with them. And we, as Antashka, have actually brought a case against the Irish government because this particular cheese factor, factory would use up one tenth of the volume of milk that produced in Ireland every year. Now, we were very much criticized by our, our uh, Tisha, Mr. Martin, there recently for doing that. But that's the real problem with climate change. Farmers have been encouraged to do this and have huge investments on it. And how do you change it? Uh, another area in Ireland is uh, 
uh, a lot of the big tech companies, Google, uh, Facebook, have set up their European operations in Ireland and want these ma major uh, data centers. The only problem is they will that will consume one fifth or one half of our electricity in the next two or three years. So again, can we have that? And yet begin to take seriously doing something, not talking about climate change. It's as easy in the world to talk about climate change. It's the doing of it, which is extraordinarily important. And the last thing is uh, a group in, in our want to introduce fracked gas from the United States so that it will be available here uh, for our energy system. So that's the real issue that we have to uh, deal with. So when we look, for example, at um, Britain leading uh, the situation going into Birmingham, uh, into Glasgow, we have very serious questions to ask. Uh, for example, uh, for for example, in the last year, the Conservative government has cut uh, overseas development aid from 0 0.7 to 0 0.5. Now here we are going to telling people, uh, the your your uh, uh, Prime Minister Mr Johnson made. made point yesterday in New York that we need 100 billion uh, uh, euro to make it possible for poorer countries to adapt to climate change. Now, that particular suggestion came out of the Copenhagen meeting in 2009, of which I was present. So actually nothing has happened on that. Again, again it's very easy to say these huge amounts of money, but nothing happens uh, on that. As I said in his own uh, when he was when he was a journalist with with the telegraph he was writing pouring cold water on uh, on uh, on the science of climate change at that time which was absolutely clear that humans were actually causing climate change because the very simple reality is we're burning fossil fuel and leave, leaving carbon dioxide behind on the on the uh, in our atmosphere yesterday he told the united nations we should look at the science the science has been clear since 1988. So if he's not clear on it, uh, what kind of uh, uh, leadership is he going to give? Or his, he, he, uh, uh, Aloka uh, Sharma, the, the UP president of, of, of COP, uh, going into, into Glasgow. So those are issues that we need to be, to be very serious on. But not, another one, for example, is two days ago, uh, or sorry, re recently, the British government had made it clear that it's interested in uh, in oil the oil fields about 150 miles off the coast of Shetland. Again, they want to keep the oil option open. And by the way, they've also put in uh, to open a, a colliery in Cumbria again. Now the reality is, the international group who deal with this, the International Energy Agency, is we have to get rid in in, in rich countries of cold fields immediately and really begin to get to see look seriously at how we use oil as well in other words we can't have it both ways we can't we say we need this for our industry uh, but sorry uh, we're not going to do it and that's that's one of the real issues at the time. everyone is talking about doing something but no one is taking it very seriously for example in the united states uh, well, we had a president who decided that climate change wasn't happened, and he pulled out of the uh, COP15 after, after the Paris negotiations in 2015. But at the, the moment, the, the, the politician who is most involved in this is a powerful Democrat from West Virginia. Now, West Virginia is the second largest coal producing state, uh, state in the United States of America. This man, Joe Munson, he has made huge amount of money, literally millions out of actually his, his work on, on coal mines and investment he has in coal mines. So he's the one who is to bring this new uh, uh, approach from President uh, uh, Biden. He's the one, to, but he's not going to undermine coal and oil in the future. And again, that's the problem we have. People will say, oh, we're all sure we have to do something about climate change, but not, we're not going to do it with coal, or we're not going to do it uh, with oil. So, and, and then the last one I want to say, uh, to, in September of this year, again, uh, it was uh, agreed to open up a third runway in Heathrow. One of the issues that has come out from the 
pand pandemic, and now in terms of uh, the science of climate change is what do we do with aviation? At the moment, about 10% of, uh, of, of energy used for transport is used in aviation. How can we make that sustainable into the future? So even though we don't know how to do that, we have decided we're going to have a third uh, a third runway in Heathrow. So again, we're saying one thing, but actually doing another. Uh, a lot of a lot of focus at the moment is naturally on China. At the moment, uh, uh, China is the largest uh, producer of greenhouse gases in the world. So, but the reality is we, we're saying that when in actual fact not per capita. The largest producers are the United States. The average person there produces 16 tons of CO2 every year. Uh, China would be eight or nine uh, tons at the moment. But still, they are the ones that have been producing particularly coal, coal fired plants around the world. Now coming up to, to uh, uh, the COP26 at, uh, at uh, uh, Glasgow, they're talking about not doing that again in other countries around the world. Again, we will have to see, uh, will that actually take place? And for me, John Kerry is uh, was former senator. He's the person from uh, that for the Biden administration is, is sending around the world. He seems to be himself very committed to, to climate change. But again, he's working. How is he going to influence his uh, uh, fellow Democrat in West Virginia to, to begin to take really uh, climate change, uh, uh, take it seriously. So another, as uh, I've been writing on climate change for 35 years, uh, it isn't something that the Catholic Church gave any leadership uh, on until Laudato Si. And I think we have to be again honest on that. Uh, where did the leadership come? Uh, for example, in these areas, and it wasn't from the, from the certainly it wasn't from from Rome. For example, the first time that climate change is mentioned is uh, in 1990. Peace with God, the Creator. Uh, peace with all creation. The oftenness is the Pope got it wrong. He actually he equated climate change with the destruction of the ozone layer. Two totally different processes that's taken place, and so that took place after Vatican II. And one of the things that uh, the, um, the prayer that started this uh, talked about the real value of God's creation. Unfortunately, that's new teaching in the Catholic Church. Uh, for me, in my lifetime, the great teaching was in, uh, in the Vatican II from uh, 1962 to 1965, but had nothing to say on the natural world. The reality is we follow Augustine and Aquinas. And for them, the natural world has no rights whatsoever. And that's the way it was for us. There is no way in your catechism that you were told uh, uh, that it was wrong to do any of these things. If the Catholic Church had followed people like the uh, St. Columbanus, St. Columban, we'd have a very different world. Uh, in, in one of his first sermons, Columbanus says, if we want to know God, learn about creation. Aquinas couldn't say that, and certainly Augustine couldn't say that. And we have taken that, those on board. So again, we have taken on a very new spirituality and theology in the last 20 years. And I think it's be fair to us to, to recognize that we have actually done this. Uh, for example, the say the climate change was first mentioned uh, in uh, by the by Pope John Paul II in in uh, peace with God the Creator it was it was the January one statement of of the 1990. Uh, for example, in Caritas et Veritate, which was a social encyclical published by Pope Benedict in in 2009, uh, climate change isn't mentioned. Now we're all of us saying climate change is one of the most serious issues facing our planet. So less than 20 years ago, it didn't appear on a uh, an encyclical on, uh, uh, on 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 social issues so we have to be honest to ourselves and say that actually didn't happen uh, for example the the compendium of the social teachings of the church which i'm sure you you all read, you all read regularly it's about 450 pages long 
It was published in 2004. And in that document, there is a, a chapter on the environment. The chapter on the environment is, a lot, is there are 16 pages. Uh, the chapter on human work is 27 pages. I think that makes it very clear what our understanding of the environment was. And by the way, in that document, there is one paragraph on climate change and one paragraph on the destruction of biodiversity. One paragraph, not 20 paragraphs, not 20 pages, not 50 pages, which they probably should have been. So the, the, when I started go, going to COPS uh, in 1992 and uh, right through the Aughties, the religious organization that gave most focus on climate change was the World Council of Churches. Uh, at every time you go to a COP, the, the, uh, the World Council of Churches would be there. They would have a position. For example, in the 1990s, they came up with a sign of peril test of faith looking at the science and looking at the theology and spirituality that was uh, uh, constant with this with this with new science uh, in 2004 they brought out another document uh, solidarity with the victims of climate change so they were the ones that actually did all the hard work right up until 2015. even in the, the one i talked about there where they talked about 100 billion the one in uh, in uh, in copenhagen World Council of Churches. Now, the Anglican Church had, had come in very much on, on that level, but the Catholic Church was hardly there at all. The huge change that took place, and it is huge. And Laudato Si is by far the most important uh, social document ever of the Roman Catholic Church. And it, 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 the one issue we had to get across is other species have intrinsic value. Now I I was I worked on Laudato Si, and I can tell you, the August before it, it, it appeared, I got a letter from Karen Turkson, who was dealing with that they were not going to deal with climate change. Oh, sorry, they were not going to deal with biodiversity. And I said to him, if if they don't deal with biodiversity, people would just laugh at it. You're going to have a document on, on, on ecology, and you're not going to have a, a document on biodiversity where we will possibly lose a million species in this century for people who are born in this century. And you're not going to put it in because there's groups within the church that don't like that, that are right, right behind the gospel and Thomas of Aquin. So that's the world that you're, you're dealing with. And uh, so our, our huge breakthrough was in, in climate change or in, in Laudato Si. It was the first time, for example, that they mentioned the scientific data on it. And it made it very clear uh, that, that climate change was actually happening and that it affects the poor much worse than it affects anyone else. And that is the, one of the issues uh, which we will have to take seriously, because even though we're only 1.1 or 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial levels, we are finding that if we go to two degrees or plus, and certainly if we go to three, there will be huge areas of the world which will not be livable in. And as Colombians, we're beginning to, people in some of the countries, for example, in which we work, like Pakistan, if you have 10 or 15 or 20 or, soft, or 40 days above uh, 50 degrees Celsius, you're not talking about doing very much work there. So there's, it's for me it's delightful now that people like skia when i started on environmental work it was mainly i was working with a tribal group and i saw the destruction of the tropical rainforest at that point you could not go to any catholic organization like skia uh, like uh, troker in ireland uh, like um, the one in, in, and ask for money for environmental organizations you could ask for for health care for all those so a huge change has taken place, but we need to understand the context in which it has, be, has, has taken place. We need to be sorry for the fact we were not actually leading this, and we need to uh, be humble, and to be humble and work with, with everyone else, and not, not declare that we were leaders in this area, when in actual fact we weren't. But in my estimation, the two most important issues facing our planet, not just humankind, 
our planet is climate change and the destruction of biodiversity. Now, we are going to have to put enormous resources uh, looking at some of the data. For example, a country like Ireland will have to put in two to three percent of its uh, gross domestic product every year for the next 20 years. That will, uh, uh, the price of energy will, will, will go up, become more expensive. Will politicians be willing to do that? Because what we've doing so far, if we say 10 years from now, you have to, your greenhouse gases have to be down by 50%. But of course, we won't be in power, it'll be somebody else in power. And by 2050, we have to be at, at neutral levels. But what are we going to do now? What are we going to do in the area, for example, of our houses? How are we going to re, re, uh, the, the refit houses? Uh, I Luckily, I, in my own house, uh, about a year ago, I would look to, to have, what would it take to make my house climate uh, resilient at the moment? Take about 50,000 euro. And that's true for almost every house in the country. How are we going to do that? These are the issues we have to take. Uh, we have to begin to ask in, in Ireland, our agriculture is this the way forward is this the way to feed the world that that green that, that agriculture is 34 percent of our of our greenhouse gas emissions uh, what about our industry for example so you're talking about vast amounts of money being directed now uh, will the, will the people support that and they will not support it if if you have people uh, like like johnson was in in 2015 uh, throwing dirty water on, on 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 the on the science of it at the time because the science was was as clear then as it is actually now as anyone who knows anything about the IPCC knows. So what needs a lot of things need to be done. Uh, agriculture, uh, our our, our, our uh, uh, system of flying, our our, our our system of transport, all those have to become uh, climate friendly in a very short period of time, less than 30 years. Uh, and I think the churches have a very significant role to play in, in helping people to make these choices for the future of our planet and for the future of, uh, uh, of humanity as well. It's an extraordinary experience that when, within 100 years, we could do enormous damage to the viability of our planet. Uh, we know that. Uh, and we know what we need to do, but will we have the courage to do it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I think we're moving over to Callum now for question and answers. Is that right? Question session. Indeed. Thank you very much, Rosa. So. Sean, thank you very much for, for your input uh, this evening. What I'd encourage, uh, just as we get this conversation going, I, I just ask everyone to, to please head over to the chat and, and start popping your questions, your thoughts, your reflections there. A reminder that you'll find the chat button at the bottom of your screen, or if you can't see that, maybe on a, a tablet or phone or smaller device, to, to tap on more and then chat. And Sean, the, the first comment has come in from Virginia, who says uh, animals are, are still not given adequate status and respect, building on what you've said already. Their suffering is not considered as important as human suffering. Cry of the animals, perhaps it's suggested, should be included in the mantra, cry of the earth, cry of the poor. Do you want to respond to that, Sean? Well, uh, for example, the, the, the fires in Australia killed literally billions of animals. Did it get, they didn't get much treatment in our theology or spirituality? I, I've got very little, yeah, because we are, we're absolutely wedded to Augustine and to a lesser extent, Aquinas. So we need, we need to be very clear about our new uh, the, uh, theology and spirituality of our planet. As I say, we have not been. As I say, there's nothing, absolutely nothing in, in uh, in the, Vatican, the documents of Vatican II on protecting our planet. Just was not there. The planet was there for us and for our needs. That was very, very clear. Even in, in one of the best of the documents, the constitution of the church in the modern world, 
So we have developed in, in Laudato Si a very new theology and spirituality. We're not even 10 years old. So unless we develop ways of dealing with this, uh, for example, this when we talk about the well-being of, of, of animals, for example, but and, and, and we, we locate those in our theology, but also in the way we worship. And we have an appalling reality of in the last 10 years, we got a, we got a, a, a version of the, of the Eucharistic prayers that, that's unusable and brings nothing of the reality of the Eucharist, the praising God for the wonder of this planet uh, into our, our, our levels of worship. So unless we begin to do this, this will not uh, be central to our lives. Uh, and again, to be central to our lives, it has to be at the level of our new understanding, but if the new understanding is there without any, any action, it's a thing called hypocrisy. Thank you. I wonder if I can take two questions together now, both of which relate to COP. And the, the first one asks, building on what we've just been speaking about, why do you think that COP 15 on biodiversity was given very little interest uh, by comparison to COP 26? Do you think it's to do with the location? Uh, and secondly, what difference do you think we can make to the outcome of COP26 in Glasgow? Okay, now there are two things here. Is the, are you talking about uh, COP, the COP15? So the, the first question was, um, why do you think COP15 was not given as much attention and focus perhaps in the media and in, in public discourse as COP26 is? Uh, well, basically people are looking at the that unless we get our act together on this one, because people will say to you now, there's still a chance if we actually take the appropriate action. Uh, because within 10 or 15 years now, you'll be saying, sorry, uh, some of the things we did, we haven't done, are going to last, be with us for thousands of years. That's the real reality. Uh, there is also a thing I didn't mention, but it's here in my, in my, uh, in my uh, notes, well, I didn't mention that a lot of third world countries, for example, uh, and third world organizations, something like over a thousand environmental and, and social justice organizations called for COP26 to be, to be postponed. And by the way, COP15, the, the one on, on biodiversity has been postponed. That, that was actually uh, scheduled for next month in Kunming in China. But the reality is, uh, so it's, it's, now, it's now going to take place in March. It has got very little attention on, on, on the media. In actual fact, both of them are very clearly uh, related because what very often happens is uh, the, the changes are taking place because of, of, uh, of uh, climate change affect other species very hugely and actually drive them into extinction. But we have not taken seriously uh, Biodiversity, as I said, when it came to this area, in uh, in Laudato Si, uh, just the the August before it was published, it was published in June of, of uh, 2015. The, the the Vatican had decided not to actually do anything on on, on climate change, which would have been absolute, an absolute unbelievable thing. Writing on ecology and not making biodiversity, particularly when we are scheduled to lose. One million species in 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 in, in, in a century, so we're not taking seriously uh, biodiversity. But a lot, sorry, a lot of people are saying uh, that COP uh, uh, twenty six should be actually postponed to next year uh, because of, of of COVID, and because, for example, <laughs> about four percent of peoples in uh, in poor countries have been vaccinated whereas uh, the significant majority in my own country here in, in Ireland, I think 88% of people over 12 have been vaccinated. So uh, how can pe people come to COP in, 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 uh, in Glasgow and make a strong case for themselves the way they're being left out of all of this by, by seriously rich nations and Britain, and that Britain is giving a leadership on this and isn't taking seriously the problems faced by the poor. How do you think we can make a difference to the outcome of COP26? Well, first of all, I, I'd like to see uh, governments signing up seriously uh, to reduce their greenhouse gases uh, by 
in, in, in a serious way. I would also then like to see us taking taking on the very very serious uh, in my, uh, uh, re realities of um, of industry. If you look at Britain, for example, huge uh, levels of public money is being put into fossil fuel extraction in coal and oil. Now, are we going to change that? Are we still going to put enormous amount of resources uh, to, to, to produce uh, fossil fuels that be, will, will be used and, 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 and leave us with, uh, with carbon footprints in, 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 into the future? So, uh, so, because that's very important, because very often now these, these, these corporations are saying it's good for for uh, governments to do things and then the individual now i'm not saying the individual don't, don't have to play uh, uh, important roles but for example if you're in a situation where there's no uh, public tra transport you you almost have to have a car so if if we, we should be making sure that processes are put in place that will make it easier and more possible for people to take these kinds of initiatives and one of the things is asking uh, where is the money going at the moment and how is this money going to very serious uh, corporations at the moment and they're not being challenged also. Perhaps uh, on that theme of, of money and the direction and the travel of money, our next question begins with an observation that the, the UK government and, and its direction on aid and nuclear weapons, along with human rights and uh, such things, you know, as an attempt to keep power how this questioner asks can we fight back against this particularly in the face of seeming unaccountability well it, it's, it's quite difficult at the moment uh because as i say a, a lot of these are populist policies and uh mr trump was huge that um, uh, uh, but boris johnson is, is very much in, in that world as i say he was very much against climate change yesterday this guy said, said that uh, I think was uh, he the prime minister has changed his mind about the environment, and uh, he doesn't he, he he talks about they they the uh, uh, the the, the guards will think may, maybe it's because of, of influence because of of his wife uh, Carrie Johnson maybe a bit, but in a sense isn't that awful you know the reality is this knowledge has been known since 1988, and these should be taken seriously since then. And now just say, because it's fashionable to say so right now, uh, I, I don't have very much uh, sympathy, nor do I actually believe it. I think one of the things that's coming through in the chat very strongly, Sean, is, is gratitude for your passion and the conviction with which you're, you're speaking tonight. That's coming through very strongly. Thank you. If I can turn to Jacinta's question, she says, if, if we as individuals committed to making just one change to our lifestyles, what would be the most beneficial thing that we could do? Again, I'd have to put this in the context of it depends what people do, you know. Uh, and, and, and for example, uh, take the situation which I gave in Ireland. Uh, Lipa was, says it's important actually uh, to move away from uh, food that that that. Uh, uh, that use animals in a way we have used animal, animals until now. So maybe to make our, our food much less uh, dependent on, uh, on on methane, for example, is the future. I think that would be would be uh, would be very important. But it is hugely important uh, to, for for us to to make put pressure on our politicians uh, because they are the ones that have to decide what kind of what kind of support are they going to give to concrete actions actually that will have happen out of uh, of uh, cop 26 and uh, as i say i i can't i can't dictate for other people you know uh, uh, what, what they need to do in in, in their lives but i want I would say that we we must put pressure on governments to make it possible for these people to change their lives in in the area of the where, where they live the level of transport the, the level of, uh, of of greenhouse gases and the kind of industries that they work, and how do we how do we re reduce all of these significantly? They're, those are the questions, and they're public questions as well as private questions. And I wouldn't like to see them being just presented as a private question 
uh, without serious engagement with, uh, with with politicians because it won't work. Thanks, Sean. I, again, just encourage everyone, please do continue to, to share your questions. It's great to see these questions coming in and we're, we're getting through quite a few of them tonight. So please do continue to share your thoughts and, and questions. Sean, you spoke a bit there about our relationship with food in, in answer to that last question. And, and Catherine asks, should we not all just be vegetarian then? I think we probably should be moving in that direction. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, and for health reasons as well as everything else. And also for the reason, one of the things we haven't taken seriously, I think we'll go back to our own church. Uh, no one seems to consider the fact that there are seven and a half billion people on the planet at the moment. And projections of in, in the next, uh, by 2050, there'll be 10 billion people on the, on the planet. And we, we, have had, we have very little to say about that. I just wonder why. So in other words, we're not taking it seriously. Is it because it's not, it's not important? Or is it important we, 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 we don't, uh, we, have, we, we have no way of going back on decisions we made in, in 1968 on Humana Vita, for example. Or is that re relevant today? I, 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 I never thought it was relevant, but it's certain it's not relevant today. And we really do have to start talking about, is this planet for every creature or is it just for humankind? And the way we have been handling the planet in the last 70 years, particularly, has been completely destructive for almost every other species. And we give no time and are no value to them. There's no value to the judgment of other people, of, of other, other creature, creatures. Now, we have to relearn all of that if we're going to be serious. The we're one species among, we don't even know how many species live on the planet with us. So, but we're, we're one species and we go forward together. Uh, and, and, and the future is all of our species together. So we're not just saying only human souls will be, will be saved into the future and, the, the, and there's nothing left of our planet. So we have huge levels to, 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 to learn and to integrate into our spirituality very quickly. Now, perhaps just as you're speaking about, uh, and I know you spoke about it in your, your contribution earlier as well, but you, you brought it up there again, Sean, about the, the church's uh, kind of background and theology on this and uh, teaching on this. And I, I want to turn to that in our next two questions. The first comes from David, who says, what's the best way to you know, bring clergy around, perhaps convert clergy to link action and care for the planet to the pulpits and to the life of worship with charity, but with truth well, it's very difficult for example i i spent uh, seven years in the seminary in a in, in an, a, a wonderful area we had three rivers on the property including the river Boyne. and uh, we had uh, we had woodlands and i never heard anything to do linking our planet uh, to our theology now, if I was teaching today, if I was teaching the, uh, the tract on the church, do you know where I'd be? I'd be down beside uh, the oak tree. And we do a good study of the oak, that it, it was responsible for, uh, for about 300 other species live because of the oak, from, from the birds uh, to the insects across so it, it, it is a species that is wonderful in biodiversity. And in that sense, it's telling us a lot about what the church should be also wonderful in biodiversity. So in other words, clergy were educated that know nothing about actually either the natural world or any level of theology that took seriously the world around them. Like for example, the oak tree, as against uh, the pine trees that are, that were imported from North America 100 years ago and support very little other species. So we had no level of making those kind of uh, really important judgments. And that's what has to happen. And I know myself from uh, working with clergy for the last 40 years. Clergy, we, even when they talk about climate change, because they're not climate change now, uh, is, that, is, that carbon, uh, is that carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide? So, to be fair, it, 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 it's, it's asking people to do something for which they were not trained at all. Now we should, uh, should, should ask ourselves, how are we training people today? Now, the reality is 
most of us understand that our my level of priesthood is completely falling apart. But we will need leadership in the free future. We'll need men and women, married and single, leadership in our church. But how we go into the, this real interesting dimension that it will be central to our theology and central to our uh, to our spirituality into the future. Laudato Si gives us an, a huge way of doing that. But even with Laudato Si, a lot of clergy and a lot of parishes don't know how to how to approach it because they were working in, in the traditional way of of the uh, uh, of Augustine and, and original sin and all of that. So it's a huge, huge uh, challenge. And unless people like CF and Troker develop ways to get leaders uh, into this and, and understanding it and working on it and improving the, 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 their uh, levels of, of, of interest in it and, and, and competence, it won't happen. And that's one of the, because uh, in one vowel swoop, the Catholic Church went from having very little to say on climate change, to say there was nothing in Caritas and Veritate, nothing. What, what, what Laudato Si, and that actually, it was extraordinary. It appeared just before COP15 in, in Paris in 2015. So it, it, it was huge, but we really have to break it down, uh, its theology and, uh, and facilitate a new understanding of what it is to be a religious person in the natural world with all these extraordinary re religious realities around all of which had intrinsic value. There is no way Pope John Paul could say other species have intrinsic value, and there's no way Pope, uh, Pope Benedict could say that. We're now saying it, and it's extraordinary. I was actually very surprised the level of the, the, the very insightful reality of climate, of, of, uh, of uh, 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 biodiversity in Laudato Si, how very well it was articulated. And it, it's actually, there's more on biodiversity, for example, than there than is in climate change in Laudato And it's very well integrated through the document. That's what we need to do. And we need to become competent in that area. Sorry, I've gone on too long. Not at all. I, I noticed though that you, you emphasized the, the lack of training for clergy as well. And I wonder, looking at our next question, uh, I, I wonder, if you would say that's the main reason that this uh, theology of creation, so to speak, is not being preached from the pulpit. Um, do you think that's the main reason? Do you think there are other reasons? And without that, how can Catholics, lay Catholics, be prompted to see that it is important? I, I would say that's true. But how, how can you preach yourself if you don't know nothing about it? If it, be, if it means nothing to you. If you didn't spend, even in seven years, you didn't spend one day down in the river talking about the reality of the wonder of water and the wonder of, of this of fish life in, in your river is moving by the seminary in which I, I was educated so yeah we, the natural world had no had no had no reality at all in our lives uh, now that has all to change and uh, what I would like to see is the whole reality of citadel church becoming the shape of moving into the future not just the clergy, but the reality of, of a, a church together uh, looks at, takes on board, understands and acts out a new way of being church in our mother world. And that the, the, the priest has a role in that, but that is not, is not the directive role, which has been the way we've looked at, at priests and religious leaders. And it was, it was actually a, a male phenomenon. I mean, the reality of how we treated women is, was, is abominable. You know, you had, I often, I often laugh at the fact that most of the, uh, the appearance of our Lord after the resurrection were to women primarily, and yet within 40 years, or what Paul or whoever wrote it, was telling women to be, to be silent in church. And we allowed that to take place for the next 2,000 years. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary that women are actually still with us. Uh, now, that has to change dramatically. And uh, if it doesn't change, the, certainly women in the future won't be part of, uh, of, of a church, uh, a misogynist church that doesn't take them seriously. Why would they? I'm going to turn to Anne's question now, Sean, which, which I found quite hard hitting when I read it at first. And she says, 
How important is it that the church shows regret and apologises for our own inaction and ignorance on climate change and its effects on animals and people and the environment? Should part of our action as activists be to say sorry and to do penance for our own failures? Oh, it should be, but all I, all I basically would like to hear is we, we, uh, that we're, we're humble. We're, you know, I, and when I talk to world, people at World Council of Churches, I learn so much from every, every, before Paris, every single time I went to a cop, I went to the World Council of Churches to say, what was their position on this, that or the other? Like, for example, I, in, in, uh, in Copenhagen, about 100 billion being available to poor countries. So they, and so, I, and I would be, I, I would praise them for doing it. The Anglican Church was, was great too, from say 2005 on. Yeah, and we, we should be, as I say, humble. I, yeah, and say sorry, but we, we, we're now going to focus, as we should, uh, about about uh, giving thanks to God for this extraordinary planet with the extraordinary creatures around it that we want to live into the future. And we see a, a, a role for the churches there now. And say, well, we, we, we weren't the leading roles, but we're, we want to be there big time now. Sean, you've spoken previously about the um, the idea of the church holding synods on biodiversity, climate change, so on and so forth. Could you perhaps say a bit more about that tonight? Yes, I could. Yeah. Well, for example, uh, you see, if you if you start with, with one of the, the good things about uh, the churches, it's found in in very different places around the world. And the other great thing is, so is biodiversity. So, for example, I would love to see starting your parish. Now, it's 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 the autumn, and uh, just begin to prepare for it. I'd love to see in your parish uh, that next uh, spring uh, that you will get a group, group of people in your parish to begin to look at God's at God's creation. So, uh, do you know the wildflowers around your area? Do you know how how flowers work? How how they trap the energy of the sun? Uh, so in other words, are, are you be, beginning to be familiar with, with the wild, uh, what about the grasses in, you, in your area? Uh, what about the trees in your area? What, what about the birds in your area? In other words, I, I, are, you, are you now going to take, yes, now we, we're saying to ourselves, we are one species among many other species. At least we're going to learn their names and have some level of empathy with them. And then, then we can move on. How will we, how will we integrate this into our liturgy? So we have a liturgy, a, a, a liturgy of thanksgiving every Sunday morning, and we never, uh, we never even mention the fact that one third of our birds are facing extinction. It doesn't en enter into our, our way of, of dealing with it. Uh, so, and then, uh, what kind of action should we be taking uh, that will arise because of our local situation? And then you can begin to say, well, that's what's happening in our local. What looks what's happening uh, throughout uh, Scotland and, uh, as a whole, uh, and what's happening in this area, and how are we as a as a as a as a, as a, as a group meeting in a similar form, uh, uh, educating ourselves and then doing things, bringing it into our liturgies and having really good, powerful liturgies like the first prayer that that was uh, given uh, this evening. How often, how often will you get a prayer like that in, in the Eucharist? As I said, we've got this appalling level of mistranslation of the Eucharist. I mean, I, I have to read the initial prayer about 10 times to know what it, what it says. Uh, uh, one of, one, one, uh, the Canon two of the Mass, I think the first line is 126 words. <laughs> Anyone will tell you uh, about uh, lines in, should be about, 20 words long at, at the very most. It's appalling. And we have, and when we say, the Lord be with you, we said this very stupid thing and with your spirit. Where would anyone say so, some nonsense like that? Oh, sorry, but isn't that, that's the translation of it comes spirit to to all. I mean, this is crazy stuff. Absolute crazy. So, so we have a lot of, we, we have a lot of things to do in our own world as well. So why, why did it? Why was it? That, <laughs> That intelligent people who were bishops in Ireland and England allow this nonsense to be to be to be poured along people, and does it give them any sustenance, whatever, to about any of the things we're talking about tonight? I don't think it does. 
and and we need to get that if we're going if we if this is going to become part of our theology and our spirituality without it it, it will not become part of our spiritual or part of our action so we have a lot to do about challenging our readers to 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 come up with with relevant uh, uh, prayers that that reflect the world in which we live and the challenges which we face, like climate change and the destruction of biodiversity, which are the most serious issues facing the planet in this century. Sean, our next question comes from Tony, and he asks, "Do you have any experience of?" regenerative agriculture or agroforestry do you think that these have a, a place do you think that these can help to combat climate change oh yeah sure i mean basically i i came into uh, the whole area of my concern for the environment because i was working with a tribal group called the tiboli in the diperocar forests of southeast asia now i learned a few things for example uh uh Everyone talks about Ireland as a beautiful country and Britain, a beautiful country, you know. In the Dirkar forests of Southeast Asia, in a single hectare of land, you could get 120 or 30 different species of trees. That's in the, in the Dirkar forest. Uh, that's five times more indigenous species of trees than all of Ireland. Ireland is about 26 or 27 indigenous species. So that's the world. And of course, that was the Philippines. And in the seven, in the, since I went to the Philippines in 1960s, most the vast majority of the five forests have been just wiped out. And with them was going the topsoil and what's happening to the coral reefs and mangroves forests. So that, these are the implications of the awful way we have treated the earth. And the impact will be huge on, 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 on humans as well. How are we going to feed people like that? So. We, none of that was incorporated. And I, one of the first actually pastor letters written by a, a hierarchy in, in anywhere, in, anywhere in the world was actually what's happening to my our beautiful land, which I helped to write in 1986, I think, in the Philippines. And these are the things, these, the, 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 if, if something happens to these areas, then life would become important, very different for everyone, not just human beings. So. Uh, so yeah, all, I'd love to see in Ireland regenerative agriculture, looking at that we produce particularly plant-based foods into the future, not 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 so much meat and milk as plant-based. Now that will take a, a, a lot of creativity, uh, but we, we this brings me back to the point. There's no point in saying uh, oh, do this at at the corporate level and then the individual. It's very difficult. I'm not expecting an Irish farmers. To move out of milk production tomorrow because they're so heavily invested in it they put an enormous amount of resources into it and they're up to the bank up, up, in, in the bank they're uh, they're in debt to a huge, huge amount and it wasn't their fault because groups like uh, uh targets will tell them this is the way forward in agriculture and by the way we're only we charge it so little levels for our food in comparison to the, the generations before us that they can't make a living out of it so so these these changes are going to be pretty huge uh, across the board. Uh, uh, food will become much more expensive into the future. When I when I was growing up, your food at least cost you thirty or thirty five to forty percent of what your daily income was. Now it's down to less than twenty percent, and that's not sustainable for, for for farmers into the future. I have to say, I'm, I'm particularly enjoying as we're chatting, Sean. I'm looking through the, the chat for the questions, and I'm particularly enjoying the uh, selection of of suggestions and uh, ideas that are being shared. And as Mike says, shameless plugs or unapologetic adverts. It's, it's great to see some of these things coming in. Please, folks, take a chance to have a look at the ideas that are there, and maybe you'll find something you can take back to your own parish as well. Um, I don't normally read comments rather than questions, but there is one that I do want to, to share with you, Sean, and it's from Netta, who says it's good to see and hear you because you met in Brisbane in Australia in 2016. Netta's joining us from Australia tonight, and, and she reflects on some of the things that you shared then. I want to take Danny's question, and, and while we've already discussed the uh, outcome of COP26, this has a slightly different nuance that I think is worth reflecting on because he says that the outcome of COP26 will be inescapably linked to COVID. 
especially vaccine inequality. So what does a successful outcome look like in terms of real action by world leaders? I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't get what you're, are you, are you asking me something? So looking, looking to COP26, which will be in, inescapably linked to, to COVID, especially with vaccine inequality and issues such like, what does a successful outcome look like in terms of real action by our world leaders? Well, you see, that's the question. I, I say, uh, who is it? I, I hear Mohammed Adal. He's director of the climate energy uh, think tank, Power Shift Africa. He's calling for COP26 to be postponed until the spring 2022. Make point, make point that only 1.4 of the global south have been uh, have been vaccinated because the, uh, G7 countries have failed to waiver uh, patents on their on their vaccines, and these countries uh, uh, are not given priority uh, to vaccinate their people. So, so we're actually saying he's he's accusing us of saying uh, COP26 is for the rich, for those who have uh, who who can vaccinate their whole country. But if you can't be vaccinated, there's no place at the table for you. So I think that's very serious. Uh, uh, as I said, there's a, a lot of people from the third world would share those those kind of ideas, and I would too, because I don't think uh, I don't think anything serious yet has come up that I've heard from either Boris, uh, Boris Johnson or the uh, the man who's who, who's uh, leader of of uh, COP, president of COP twenty two say what's going to happen post uh, post uh, 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 post Glasgow. What what are, you, what are you going to do? And what kind of monies are you going to make available so these can happen in terms of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions uh, across the board from housing from agriculture from industry and from transport and how you have so the, the, on those this, those are addressed climate change is the easiest thing in the world so Boris Johnson was saying uh, he has changed his mind now he didn't tell you that it was 2015 and at, at that stage actually uh, the, the IPCC, because the IPCC, I mean, the, o, o, over a thousand uh, scientists in in each one of the, of, of those reports that we prepared since two thousand since nineteen ninety. So, uh, were they wrong in two thousand and fifteen? They were not wrong, but he was he he was not taking them seriously, and 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 nor, nor did Mr. Trump afterwards. And tragically, a lot of people of Catholic faith think that they are, are doing something worthwhile for their country with absolutely did done nothing. I want to pick up, we've spoken a bit about a couple of themes in particular tonight, but I'm returning to the theme of, of training and formation for clergy. But specifically this time, what responsibility do bishops have for the ongoing formation of their clergy in matters so serious as the theology of creation? Okay, I would say to you, I say to anyone here, uh, to, to, if you ask most bishops in, in, in England or Ireland or Wales to tell me uh, uh, what, what should they do in, in, in terms of COP26, in terms of this extraordinary challenge, biodiversity destruction and climate change, how should we integrate that into the future of training of the clergy? And I would be surprised if more than 2% knew anything about it. Or that you have heard them speak about it. I mean, I've been involved in in Ireland producing a, a document actually on climate change in 2006, but it it it, it, it hardly anyone has has run with 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 the findings, because again, they were in the same seminary in the same way as I was. They never learned nothing about integrating this into a theology. It was, it was obviously it hadn't the slightest it hadn't the slightest place in theology. So you're now asking how, how to get a really serious engagement of this. And well, you need to know something about it. And in that sense, a lot of will, will I, I think in Catholic schools, you'll be depending on people who teach biology, you know, who teach chemistry and physics. And, and, and then helping them. Uh, uh, my, my very good friend, uh, John Feehan, has brought out a book with Trokra just two, two months ago, trying to integrate this new understanding with our theologies uh, in, 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 in the past and making a new synthesis of this. 
and, and giving you ways of actually upgrading yourselves and changing your, making sure this is now a serious part of your uh, training. But I mean, for example, I, I've been writing a list for, for, uh, for almost 40 years. I've never been once invited to the seminary in Manus to give a talk on any aspect of, bio, of biodiversity or of climate change. Because I don't think they think it's important. That, that, that's at the heat of the hunt. They don't even if, if, if you press them, they say, well, maybe now that's, uh, the Pope mentioned it in Laudato Si, and maybe it is. But it's, it's not, if it was important, they'd do it. So what, can we, what, what can we do? What can we do, Sean, then, as, as lay Catholics here gathered? What, what can we do to raise this uh, and, uh, and tackle this level of, of apathy with bishops and Episcopal conferences? Well, I'd say apathy, maybe, but, but just lack of knowledge. But so I, I would say to you, let, her, let us begin by putting on, <laughs> I could get you very good people who, who would actually give them over three or four days a real sense that this is the face of the future of our church and of, and of our world. And the people have put uh, uh, every fire aglow. That's John Fian's book, and it, it's very, very good. Now, it, it's not something you, you it'll take a bit to read it because it, this is a new understanding of what it means to be Christian in our modern world and to integrate that into our theology, but especially into our spiritualities. And that that's how we will present ourselves in the future. And, and encourage bishops to do it. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't want to. to uh, to be seen as attacking bishops, because uh, to be fair, they don't know, and uh, it, it'd be, it's unfair to, to, to charge them with things that they ne never learned. But now it, it needs to change. And Laudato Si gives it, it, it's it's a very well worked, well written document too, uh, which is extraordinary. Because very often these documents are not very well written, and uh, I think, but uh, it, it, very interesting would be the point you yeah, you asked me. How do you introduce, you introduce it locally? Because that's actually how the natural world is given to us. It's not given to us in generalities. It's given to us in local dimensions, the wildflowers. I mean, for example, in my, say, say, in my area of agriculture, what have we done in agriculture? I mean, John, John again brought out a book about 15 years ago. There were four, about 40 different grasses uh, grown in Ireland uh, and in Britain. Uh, up to the, the 1970s. And then gradually, what did they do? They got rid of most of them. Uh, they used ryegrass, but ryegrass won't grow unless you, you pour nitrogen on it. And where does the nitrogen end up? It ended up in your, in your, in your groundwater and, you, and you, in your rivers. So when I was growing up, the, you, you, the Environmental Protection Agency said there was 500 lakes and rivers in our top class in terms of water realities. Do you know how many there is now? 20. 20. That's the often da damage we've done. And we're not even used to it. I'm a Columbus, for example. And we run, run, run a farm in, 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 in Dalga. And we have put ryegrass in there. And I, I bring people to the front door. I say, look, look out there. You're looking at a desert. There's maybe three Greek species of ryegrass there, of which you, they're, they're pour, pouring nitrogen and that's how they do that's how we now have much much more uh, cows there than we had 15 20 or 30 years ago and everyone thinks to think that's that's fine that's okay but that's what the problem is it's not okay so we need to ch challenge these issues very seriously and we must look when we've been slow to do that Sean, in your answer, you referenced a book uh, that, that looks at the, you know, integrating climate change uh, into theology and, and RE, perhaps, for children. Um, there's a couple of like-minded folk, and as an RE teacher myself, I'm going to ask the same question. Can you tell us what the book's called? Uh, I, 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 every Flower of Flame, I think. Uh, God, the Natural World, uh, and Science. And it's, it's, it's published by... It's published by uh, uh, Veritas about at, about uh, six weeks ago. Actually, it was, it was launched that last week. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm sure uh, there will be a few people furiously Googling as we speak now. Um, yeah. I want to turn to, to a question from Catherine, who perhaps uh, looking at, at issues around 
development and planning and and the destruction of biodiversity to to build and to create should trees and biodiversity be given a greater protected status as living creatures well it all depends on what kind of trees for example i have said native trees for trees yes yeah i mean uh, at the moment i'm over here in the west of ireland it's, it's gorgeous but the, the amount of of of, uh, of, of uh, uh, pines for example introduced here in the last 40 50 years I, they, they don't support any, any other species you certainly we're talking about uh, oak for example but then some some of our species for example the dieback in ash is having a huge impact here uh, as it is in britain is having here, here on 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 uh, in ireland but yes the point you're making should other species have have moral values? The answer is absolutely yes. It, uh, particularly if they're part of, the, of, of, if they're part of that the, the, the local reality in that area. But Lawson, for very uh, talk, talking about those, they wouldn't have no. Again, very, very powerful. I am. I'm just going to share in the the chat at the moment uh, the a link to the the book. Um, every bush of flame. Thank you to, to Grace as well, Grace Buckley, for, for sharing the name of it there as well. So there's a, a link to it on Veritas for anyone who's looking. And um, I wonder, you know, perhaps just to, to start winding up our, our, our time in this Q&A, Sean, maybe just to, to come back to this question here um, from Patricia, who says, I really don't understand how bishops and priests cannot know something is amiss when it's going on in the real world around us is there an expectation that they would read laudato si perhaps and then perhaps building on that um a few comments made observing from what you're saying perhaps this idea that we need to look beyond the clergy that as you're saying sean this change starts at such a local level that it starts with all of us can you comment a bit more on that well, yes, and I, I, we're looking at the issues of, of biodiversity. We're looking at, at, at climate, our, uh, biodiversity and, and climate change. We then have to ask ourselves, like uh, when I leave, when, when I left, left mass last Sunday, what what was in the, the liturgy that helped me in any way to give thanks to God for the wonder of, uh, of of nature around us? And has that been integrated into the liturgy? And why is not being integrated? And when will it be inter inter integrated? These are the questions on an ongoing level we need, which we need uh, uh, to ta tackle. Then find the other things we can do. Uh, then integrating that into our spirituality. Then doing things about it, if we, if we can. Doing things about it locally, as parishes, for example. For example, a lot of the, have many parishes begun to say, okay, uh, we're going to have to deal with, with the places where we live. Well, a lot of people live in parishes. So in your parish, what, what have they been, is there anyone talking about how we're going to actually make our, 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 our houses more climate resilient in the next 10 years? And what kinds of money is available, for example, from the, from, from, from the government for that? And if we do as a parish, it'll bring down costs. And it would also be a central issue for, for, our, uh, for, uh, for our understanding of of, of good things we, we we could do, and then we might be learning something out of it that we pa could pass on to other parishes who are trying to do the same thing, and that's the reality of living the Christian life. That we 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 confront something, we do something about it, we learn of it, and we continue to do that. Now those have to be done in the next ten years. That we the British government and the Irish government said we have to reduce our greenhouse gases by 50% by 2030. Now, our church is willing to, to, to help out by making sure that every parish will take this on board. And we're, going to, we're looking for support from the government, looking for support from, 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 from other groups like, like industry uh, in the area that will have some money uh, uh, that can invest in these areas. That's the kind of thing and then we'll talk about prayers. We'll, every Sunday morning, we'll have prayers about that. But we'd also like to see a, a canon in the, in, in the Eucharist about work, work, working together to, to, to uh, create spaces where we can live 
in a way that's not destroying our planet for ourselves or other species. Well, Sean, thank you very much. I have enjoyed our conversation immensely. Thank you very much to everyone who has sent in questions and kept the conversation going. And I'll hand back over to Rosa. Okay. Thanks, Callum. Um, I think I want to hand over just now to Stephen Curran, who's the manager of Eco Congregation Scotland, another of the groups who have co-badged our conversation this evening. Um, so welcome, Stephen, and I think you're going to give a vote of thanks to Sean. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosa, and, and thank you to Callum for his expert way of managing that fantastic conversation. Indeed. Um, this is the easiest job in, in, in Glasgow where I am tonight, the host city for COP26. Looking forward with hope and joy, but with a sense of urgency with that fantastic presentation and question and answer session. Um, Eco Congregation Scotland is an environmental charity that supports churches across Scotland with a vision of a Scotland that cares and acts for God's creation. We now have 39 Catholic parishes among our 550 and growing number who are clearly motivated by COP26 as a call to action for us all to act. And what was fantastic about the presentation from Sean was it was a faith-based challenge to COP26, but it was really a challenge to us all. COP26 is not just for those of us in Scotland who obviously have to offer a hospitality and welcome for those of you online or hopefully in person who can be part of COP26 itself. But it's about what happens afterwards, what happens with the decisions that are taking place there, but the action we can all take. And that call to worship, action and advocacy in our own lives and in the life and mission of our local churches was really quite profound tonight. Um, Sean mentioned the leadership that had been lacking in our own Catholic church on this issue. But one thing that is equally true is that his prophetic voice has been a very powerful leadership demonstrating how we can take the loss of biodiversity and the threat of climate change seriously. And that's a prophetic voice we all have to continue to share and step up to the plate on ourselves and show in leadership in our own parishes and communities and around the world through our church. I particularly like to thank Sean for his insight, his frankness, and it's true when people say time flies when you're enjoying yourself. We've got certainly a sense of joy, hope, and urgency around this issue, but that was a very quick question and answer session because we all got so much out of it. So thank you very much, Sean, particularly for your continuing efforts in this field. I'd like to conclude uh, with us all joining with a prayer for Sean. Loving God, we thank you for the gift, insight and ministry of Sean. We thank you for what he has shared with us tonight. We ask that you anoint him anew with your spirit, such that your life may be deepened within him. Amen. <laughs>